Welcome to the Columbia Art and Technology Lectures. Uh, my name is Reinhold Martin. I don't teach in the School of the Arts. I, I in fact, teach in the, in the School of the Graduate School of Architecture. Um, and uh, but Mark Tribe wasn't able to be here tonight, and he asked me to stand in for him in welcoming uh, your fourth speaker in this series, uh, Manuel Delanda. Um, my uh, sort of opportunity to introduce Manuel is perhaps not entirely incongruous since he's been teaching with us on the other side of the campus um, uh, since 1995 um, in uh, filling the lecture halls uh, with uh, radically philosophical uh, courses on, uh, on such topics as materials and, uh, and, ur and urbanism. Um, so, uh, so it's great to sort of uh, cross uh, the way here and, and have a chance to, in a way, continue the conversation on, on the other side of the university. Um, Manuel Delanda was born in 1952 in Mexico City and has lived in Manhattan, this is the official part, uh, since 1975. He began his career in the mid-70s as an independent filmmaker, uh, showing his films in cine clubs and museums around the world. In 1980, uh, he, he strategically acquired an industrial grade computer and became a programmer and computer artist. We were just hearing about SIGGRAPH, uh, what, 1982? Yeah, 82, yeah. that's right. All right. Um, writing his own software for several years. Um, uh, he has also written, uh, he writes in, in that sense at many levels, uh, many philosophical essays which have appeared in, uh, in numerous journals and he lectures extensively in the United States in, and Europe on uh, nonlinear dynamics, uh, theories of self-organization, artificial intelligence and artificial life, among other subjects. Uh, he is the author, uh, as you probably know, of, uh, of the important books, War on, in the Age of Intelligent Machines, uh, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, with a great cover, uh, and Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy. In 2000-2001, Manuel was also a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies uh, at Princeton, another kind of interesting combination, uh, if you know that institution. Um, uh, and uh, tonight's lecture will be uh, Deleuze uh, and the use of the, the genetic algorithm uh, in art. So, uh, and, and Mark had also just asked me to remind you that the art and technology lectures will continue uh, with Ricardo Dominguez uh, on May 12th. And indeed, you'll find video streams uh, of all the lectures in this series online uh, at the website of the Digital Media Center. So please join me in welcoming Manuel Delanda. Hi everyone. The point of this lecture, this is, the, this is my first class of the second semester at Columbia. I'm going to adapt it a little bit to, to a new audience. The main point of the lecture is to introduce the basic ideas of the, philo the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, which, uh, as you know, comes from the same generation as many other postmodern philosophers in, 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 in France. But unlike those postmodern philosophers, Deleuze is a materialist philosopher. To begin with is someone who believes the world exists independently of our minds, which is more than I can say for most other postmodern philosophers. You know, for me, no, not in, in most other philosophies that come from the continent of Europe, basically we create the world by cutting it out with language or with concepts, and, and they concentrate mostly on phenomenology. Deleuze doesn't write one word about phenomenology. He wrote his very first book on Hume, meaning he buys a completely different theory of experience and of sensation, which of course ends up having repercussions in his ideas about art. So I want, his, um, his materialism is very timely. It's, it's, it's very good that we finally had a, a new materialism to replace the old dialectical materialism based on Hegel. Since the left needs rejuvenation, needs, needs some fresh new ideas, uh, and they have to be based on a materialist philosophy. Idealism, doesn't matter what postmodern people say, is an inherently, inherently conservative ideology. But materialism has demonstrated for many decades now to be a, a progressive philosophy. The problem is it needs to be based on science. It needs to be based not on an uncritical acceptance of science. It, science needs to be approached critically. But of course, we need to always go to the experts on matter. The problem with the old materialism is that the only type of mat material entity that it included was physical labor, the physical labor of the working class, where the true materialism needs to give matter its due. Uh, on the other hand, I want to also, uh, and this is just a way of kind of giving these ideas a slightly more relevant 
uh, touch in a kind of uh, computer art type of way. Um, I'm going to be linking this with ideas about the genetic algorithm. The genetic algorithm is basically a so piece of software that's relatively old now, it was born in the 1960s, which uh, mimics evolution. It's sort of like virtual evolutionary processes in the computer. The, uh, even though it sounds relatively new, it isn't. Some parts of Windows 95, which is already an old piece of software, were actually bred. You know, bred like you breed dogs, or like the way people breed uh, uh, race horses. Uh, bred through successive generations in which the, the, the programmer, instead of writing code by hand, was actually just steering the evolution, the way in which uh, a dog breeder does. You know, a dog breeder begins, uh, of course, this is a, an ideal a case, you know, with mongrel dogs, a bunch of mongrel dogs, let's assume. Of course, that's not the way it actually works. Mongrel dogs have all the genes for all the different dogs, uh, all the different dog styles, uh, but combined, and, with the, and the task of the dog breeder is, of course, to extract the signs from that mongrel by picking uh, in every generation, for instance, uh, for certain physical or uh, uh, behavioral traits. You can be picking for smaller size, smaller size, smaller size, and more and more and more obnoxious, and you end <laughs> up with a chihuahua dog. Or you can be picking for larger and larger size and hairier and perhaps a kind of a, uh, an altruistic disposition. You end up with a San Bernard. And the idea is that all these designs are implicated or there in the mongrel dog. And so there is a certain way, in which, a certain sense in which art can actually be done via, or uh, uh, that artists can utilize uh, uh, evolutionary processes as one more tool, not to replace them, but simply as one more tool, one more visualization tool that they can bring to the task of creating computer art. As I was saying, Windows 95, which is already seven or well, almost 10 years old, some of the very, very small pieces, the pieces that deal, is called, they are called drivers, the, the, the ones that interface directly with a printer, with a modem, that need to be particularly efficient, were bred this way. They were not programmed by hand. So the genetic algorithm is relatively old. It's already part of industry. So it's, it's, there's nothing new about it. What's new about it, in, in a sense, is its utilization by artists. And so I want to be talking about that too. So let me first introduce a little bit, a uh, few ideas on, on Deleuze's materialism. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, one of the main reasons why most postmodern philosophers went idealist, that is, Everything is done with language, everything is a text, everything is just a matter of interpretation in a semantic kind of way. It's because when you assert that the world exists independently of our minds, you end up being an essentialist. In other words, if you believe that hydrogen atoms exist independently of our minds, that dogs exist independently of our minds, that clouds and mountains exist independently of our minds, what guarantees their identity? What makes them maintain that mind independent identity? Well, an essence. Uh, hydrogen atoms have an essence, which makes them what they are. Mountains have an essence, mountainhood, which makes them what they are. And so clearly that is unacceptable. That is just to reintroduce a kind of, a kind of idealism into, into a fake materialism. No wonder so many people, so many philosophers in the 20th century went idealist. They didn't want to have anything to do with essences. So the novelty of Deleuze is having created um, a new materialism which gets rid of essences. Basically, essentialism it has many faces, but one of them is a theory of the genesis of form. This is why it's very important to artists, since artists are involved in the genesis of form, in the processes that, that give birth to new forms. Uh, essentialism basically says matter and energy are inert. They do not have any morphogenetic capabilities. They cannot give rise to new forms on their own. Forms come from a world of essences or from the mind of God. Creationism is another form of idealism, another form of essentialism. Uh, in, and they are, form begins as a concept in the mind of God. And then it's imposed on this inert matter who can't do anything but just sit there as a command. Let there be light. Let there be animals and plants. Let there be form. Form cannot emerge from matter itself. So Deleuze turns this around and says, 
what the last 30 years of science in nonlinear dynamics, fractal theory, chaos theory, theories of self-organization and complexity and so on have demonstrated beyond any doubt is that matter is morphogenetically charged, that it has powers of morphogenesis of their own, and that this should somehow alter the position of the artist with respect to his or her materials. The artist can play the role of God, of course, and have an image, a cerebral project exclude that, that, that is, well, this is the form I want to create, then buy more or less domesticated materials like mild steel or other forms of industrial metals which have become almost inert, and then impose that form on that particular, say, a sculpture on that particular piece of metal. Or the artist can recognize that materials have powers, creative powers of their own, and enter into a partnership with the materials in the genesis of form. My, my favorite example here is the architect Frei Otto. Frei Otto is a German architect who worked for a long time in Stuttgart's uh, Institute for Lightweight Structures. He was responsible for the 10 light roofs of the Munich Olympics in 68. Uh, and the way he designed, because this is before computers, or as computers were coming along, he could have used computer graphics, you know, 3D computer, anima uh, computer packages to create those beautiful uh, 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 shapes that make his tent-like roofs, but he didn't have access to that. So what he did is he used soap film as a, you know, one of the most humble materials that you find in your kitchen and your bathroom, you know, to assist them in the calculation of the forms. Soap, because it's morphogenetically pregnant, although it does very, very simple things, has already tendencies. It's not inert. So film, all you have to do is blow a little bit on it, and a sphere comes out all by itself. You know how hard it is for artists to create real spheres? You know how hard it was for Buck, Mr. Fuller to come up with his geodesics in a spherical form? And soap does it all by itself. All you have to do is blow. <laughs> of course, he didn't want a sphere. He wanted tent like roof, so he needed to put something of himself. So what he did is basically, I, you know, I don't know the apparatus he used. I imagine him in slippers and in his bathroom. You know, he took a piece of plywood, put little, uh, he, of course, was going to design this at scale, smaller scale. He put uh, little uh, wooden sticks where the columns that would eventually hold this tent-like roof would be. Uh, loosely hanging threads attached the tips of the, of the columns to serve as constraints on the soap. Lower this, this, artif this, this thing into the bathtub then pulled it out very carefully through the surface so as not to break the soap, and the soap had magically computed uh, the surfaces for him. Because soap tends by itself to minimize surface tension, that is what film, soap film does, and when you don't constrain it, that minimization, that tendency results in a sphere, but when you do constrain it, it results in a variety of shapes, which are also minimal shapes, which are always beautiful. Now that's an example of an artist entering into a partnership with the materials. He didn't try to come up with the forms in his head and then impose them on a bunch of workers and say, well, now I want this, you have to come up with it. It was a kind of interaction with the materials where he recognized, in fact, he uses the word form finding for his little uh, 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 setups and his little assemblages where he gets materials to do a little, a, a little bit of the design for him. And in a way, this is what Deleuze has all the time been talking about. Not only for art, but in general, for industry, for economics, for sociology. The material aspect of our lives, the material aspects of our cities are meshing with the environment in a, in a more uh, irrational or at least less irrational way. Uh, needs to take into account the flows of genes through generations, the flows of flesh or biomass through food chains, the flows of water, the flows of air, and until we begin to make, create a partnership with the material world instead of trying to impose our will, preconceived will on this material world, we are in trouble. So that is basically his materialism. I'm going to give you a, a more details about this. Now the genetic algorithm. The genetic algorithm is simply, as I said, a simulation of evolution in the computer. <clears throat> it can only be applied, for the same reason, to art done in the computer. So for the, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to assume that some of you, at least, 
utilize the computer. This doesn't mean that the final product needs to be computer graphics or computer music or computer anything. You can be using the computer as an intermediate step to something. Like if you're a choreographer and you are using the computer to, you know, with little stick figures to create some movements and so on, and you're just using them as an intermediate step in the design process of your choreography, that would still count. Or it can be the type of computer artist whose final output is a computer output. But the computer needs to be involved at some point or another. Obviously, otherwise, the genetic algorithm would not be applicable. Second, it can only be applied to art in which the artistic element, the design elements, whether the brush strokes in a painting, the notes and motifs, and so on, in a, in a, in a piece of music, the, the different bodily movements in a, in a choreography, the, the different spatial components in a sculpture, uh, are defining the computer not via clicking with a mouse, which is the way most of us do it, but procedurally. You know, most programs, Photoshop, Maya, which is a 3D uh, pro now come with little script writing capabilities. Of course, most of us are, you know, not, well, I became a hacker very early on in my life, as, as I, the introduction just said. You know, so I learned how to program in the early 80s, but I was forced to do that because my computer that I had just spent my family fortune on uh, didn't do anything. Back then, you couldn't buy software. So I was forced, and I was kicking and screaming, brought into the, into the programming world. But then I realized, after a couple of years of pain, that uh, it was the best thing that could have happened to me. Because for the first time, I understood process. I, I understood how the computer can be used to specify processes. How algorithms, which are simply mechanical recipes, can be used to specify a process that in turn generates a particular formal element. This process approach to computer art is now becoming more and more a, a, a well known in the sense that the software packages themselves come with this scripting capabilities. Before you either you had to click and you know mouse and click your way through, through 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 the process. Now you can do it with a mouse or a tablet or whatever other input devices you have, or you can begin to think in terms of process. It involves not math, but a little bit of formal thinking, because you need to learn about loops and, and how to represent processes within a computer language. But it pays in the end, because you can do many things that you could not do by clicking and mousing around. Specifically, you can create works of art that then lend themselves to performance. Since every single element of the work of art is produced in the computer, and you can interact and intervene in it, uh, changing parameters, changing buttons, and so on as it produces it, it lends itself to a, to a wider variety of applications than just clicking and mousing. Regardless of that, I'm not going to go into that specifically. It is absolutely necessary to apply the genetic algorithm that the elements of design are specified as a process, as a little program, because it is those programs that play the role of genes in the computer and that generate what, uh, what comes out on the other side. Examples of this include, there's a British artist who is a sculptor. His name is William Latham, L-A-T-H-A-M. I recommend that you read his book on genetic art. He has very pretty pictures. I've been doing computer modeling for a long time, 3D modeling. I did that for a living for a long time. That's how I paid for my books. My books cost me money. They don't really make, I don't really make any money out of those suckers. Uh, <laughs> And I remember when I opened William Latham's book for the first time, and I thought, oh my god, he did not even model, he did not even touch with the mouse one of these little complex creatures. Uh, he actually bred them. He began, because he gives you the genealogical trees with the grand, 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 grandparents, and, you know, and so on. And you see that it begins with a larvae kind of looking things, and then they begin sprouting you know, arms and, and, and weird things. you know. Uh, and then at the end, he picks one, you know, like a dog breeder. He picks his little chihuahua dog of a sculpture. And this what is the final product. Uh, interesting, but I want to tell you some limitations. Precisely, this is where the list comes in. How to remove the limitations of the software. What kind of philosophical resources need to be brought in addition to the software to make this work. Another example, his name is Blinds, John Blinds. A musician, a jazz musician, and as a jazz musician, he was accustomed to interacting with humans. As, as everybody knows, jazz musicians play on each other's music 
you know, and as the clarinet is finishing a particular line, it goes, okay, take it away, sax, and the sax needs to kind of have heard the last few notes or the last few bars, of the, uh, and then exploit it for melodic ideas, and then you begin jamming with the other person doing that. Now, Blinds wanted to do the same thing with a computer. He wanted to travel around jazz uh, uh, clubs playing with a computer, but he knew that if the computer just played canned melodies, the audience was going to get bored, he was going to get bored, he was going to have absolutely any, 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 any kind of rapport with the other participant because it was just playing canned music that he himself had put in. So he took a genetic algorithm to breed melodic pieces, melodic lines in real time. The computer is constantly listening to the human performer. His, his uh, piece of software, by the way, is called Gen Jam, Gen as in genetic, Jam as in a jam session. Gen Jam. Gen Jam now plays in jazz clubs. And it's accepted as a human because it's not bad. It's not a bad player. <laughs> and the hope, though, that what's interesting is that every single melody that comes out of Gen Jam speakers is bred like a Chihuahua dog. Now, to me, that signals that something new is in the offing here. There is, of course, a, 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 a other, other art, art, artists that have utilized this. There are, in fact, urban planners. John Fraser, a British urban planner, has, has, has utilized genetic algorithms to breed proposals for new developments of cities. It can be used at different scales. Again, the most important thing is the elements need to be specified as a process. For sculptors, this is rather simple because everything you create in a CAD system, in a 3D CAD system, is simply a sequence of instructions. So for instance, you want to create a, 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 a column you're an architect and you want to begin creating a, a fancy column. Well, the first step is to draw the outline of the column. The second step is to spin it, to rotate, to create a, what is called a surface of revolution, which is now a kind of cylindrical type shape with the shape or the profile that you drew. Then uh, you can make some carvings to give it some, you know, what, call, what is called Boolean functions to carve out some decorations in the column. It's a process. It's a sequence of instructions that generates a column. The sequence of instructions can then be stored and become the DNA of the work of art. Of course, there's got to be one for each one of the elements in that particular architectural piece. So software, is, 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 is software writers, software creators, the people who sell this stuff, like Photoshop, uh, the parent company of Photoshop and so on, Adobe, I think it's called, are beginning to realize that they need to give artists more power over their software. Otherwise, the software imposes its look on the artist. Everybody has seen stuff that's photoshopped to death. You know, Wire Magazine used to be a little bit like that, you know, where you could say, oh, well, that, you know, I can even see the filters that this guy applied here. You know? <laughs> uh, and the sequence of the filters and everything. And that is not good for artists because that constrains you. So learning how to write even simple scripts is a good thing because that you begin to take over the software. You begin to impose now a little bit of your own will on the software instead of some software designer in California or somewhere, you know, telling you what to do. It's hard at, the, at first because it's on familiar territory, but it pays in the end. Believe me, you know, I always tell my students this in the first day of class, or so maybe I'm getting a little too pedagogic here. Uh, let's all be hackers, people. <laughs> Anyway, how do we blend these two things? How do these two things have to do with one another? The neo-materialism of Gilles Deleuze and the genetic algorithm. Well, they have to do with one another because genes out there in nature or even inside our own sperm and eggs count on the fact that matter is active in order to generate all the variety of natural forms that we see around us, plants, animals, insects, uh, uh, microorganisms, and so on. Genes do not specify, the genes are not a representation of the final form, as if it were a blueprint, uh, uh, an iconic representation of what's going to come out. And therefore, matter is not as if genes are now like God telling matter what to do, commanding matter to do this or that. Genes tease out a form out of materials which have their own morphogenetic potential. And evolution has been able to do what it has been able to do only and exclusively because of that morphogenetic potential. If it was all up to genes, we would still be all microbes. Complexity can only be teased out of matter in certain ways. And so if that is necessary in nature, it clearly is necessary in the computer. 
we need to bring certain ideas from neo-materialism, delusion materialism, to the computer for the genetic algorithm to actually perform its job. The Lewis virus from science, three forms of thinking, three reasoning styles, which I, I want to call population thinking, intensive thinking, and topological thinking. Each one comes from a different branch of science. The first one comes from evolutionary biology, was created basically population thinking in the 1930s, uh, when the ideas of Darwin and, and Mendel were for the first time blended together. Uh, intensive thinking comes from thermodynamics, 19th century thermodynamics, as well as 20th century thermodynamics. Topological thinking comes from mathematics. And mathematicians, thermodynamicists, evolutionary biologists, each one has that reasoning style which has served them well in their own disciplines, but be precisely because of the interdisciplinary boundaries that define this our over-specialized academy, they do not communicate with one another. There clearly are some ecologists who need a little bit of thermodynamics, a little bit of evolutionary biology and blended too, but no one has really blended these three radically different styles of thinking which emerged in the, you know, in the 20th century, uh, or that acquired their final shape in the 20th century. And so we need a philosopher. This is, in a way, what philosophers do. They do synthesis. They get the best out of one specialty. They get the best out of another specialty. They jump over uh, uh, silly uh, academic boundaries that define fields that are maybe at war with one another because, you know, so the sociology department wants more money that the economics department now cannot get. And, 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 and they now, they backmouth each other. You know, economists are all for rational choice. Oh, yeah, sociologists are all for ritual and ceremonial. You know, <laughs> we need both. We both make choices and follow routines. So we need sociology, we need economics. And so the same thing goes for the rest of science. So philosophers can bring something new to science, which is a synthesis, revealing something that scientists themselves may not have seen in their own uh, over-specialized blindness. So let me explain how these three forms of thinking work. First, population thinking. Population thinking basically says that in order for evolution to take place, you always need a large reproductive community. Adam and Eve won't work. You cannot start with two entities of that particular kind. There's just not enough space for the mutations to propagate. There's not enough space for the variation that, 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 uh, that drives evolution. I remember that what evolution, the way in which evolution uh, destroyed essences, at least in biology, is that essentialists, Aristotelian essentialists in particular, used to think of, you know, for instance, you see a population of zebras. There is somewhere an essence of zebrahood. Zebrahood is a, is a list of traits that make a zebra what it is, that give a zebra its identity. There's the perfect zebra, the one that meets all the specifications, and then there's all the imperfect, imperfect zebras that we see with variations in camouflage, in height, and so on. Uh, you have to get past the heterogeneity, past the difference, past the imperfections to reach the perfect zebra. Population thinking says it's exactly the other way around. Imperfections are crucial. Heterogeneity and variation is what drives evolution. You homogenize a population, say through biotechnology or some capitalist agriculture, and you stop evolution in its tracks. Heterogeneity, difference, is, is crucial to the process and needs to be valued because, because natural selection, which is just a filter, all it can, it, it is just a mechanical filter. It just lets certain genes pass, certain genes not pass. The moment all the genes are the same, it has nothing to filter, nothing to sort out. So, for the first time, evolutionary biologists brought us a positive idea of difference, a positive idea of heterogeneity, a valuable form of variation, which is absolutely needed. And so population thinking also allows us to go past the cliches of Darwinism in the 19th century, which degenerated into really bad politics with social Darwinism, such as survival of the fittest, or struggle for survival, or things like that, that made it seem as if, you know, a winner takes all and evolution is all about, you know, shedding blood and nature red in claw and, and, and in tooth and claw or something like that. Uh, whereas, in fact, there are many, many, many ecological strategies. There's symbiosis, there's predator-prey relationships that have nothing to do with competition. 
And, clear, and another point that is very important is there's no such thing as the fittest. The fittest assumes that, that there's only one best design. It's going back to essentialism, the essence of the zebra, and then natural selection just brings us to that perfect zebra. Today, population thinkers realize that there's in fact multiple equilibria, that most species are trapped in local optima, that there's no such thing as the best design. So population thinking has switched the slogan of Darwinism from survival of the fittest, or one of those silly ones, to evolution is an automatic search process. It automatically searches a space of possibilities. The genetic algorithm is classified in computer science as a search algorithm. Search algorithms, search recipes are extremely important in computer science, not only because every time a new one gets invented, some Google guy gets, becomes millionaire, but because just about every operation that you have to do in your computer demands searching. When you save a file, the computer needs to search the hard disk for empty space. You can be searching for words, searching for files themselves, searching for something in the internet. Searches are are ubiquitous in computer science. So every time a new search algorithm comes along, they just go crazy for it. And the genetic algorithm is one such thing. It automatically, in parallel, every member of the population, of course, moving one tick at a time every time they pass their genes is a very, very slow process. Remember, evolution doesn't see organisms. Evolution sees the species. So it doesn't see us. It only sees us the moment we pass our genes to our babies. It is only at that point that we enter into the picture. And every time one of these virtual creatures passes its genes, the, the whole population moves a little bit in this space, a little bit in this space, a little bit. At, at blindly groping, because evolution doesn't have foresight. It cannot, evolution cannot favor today a wing, a proto-wing, because it's going to be useful 200 years down the road. Evolution is opportunistic. It only, it only catches what's now, new now. But in its blindness, in its blind groping in this space of possibility, let's call it a search space, in the blind groping of search space, it's very effective at finding new things. And so it's being used in industry as a searcher, but artists can, of course, use it as a visualization tool. Artists many times do searches themselves. They, put, they, they draw five variations of a facade, for instance, then they step back, pick the best one and draw five variations on that one. And then they step back and then they maybe pick another one and they do five variations on that one. And they, that's basically what evolution does, except that it does it with hundreds of drawings at a time. So the genetic algorithm is not going to replace the artist clearly. It's simply one visualization tool, one more visualization tool added to the increasingly complex kit of tools that artists need, can bring now to the job of creating new forms. But let's just stop at that. Population thinking tells us evolution is a search process and a very effective search process. I'll come back to more details in a second. The second form of thinking, I remember this is a reasoning style. It's a reasoning style in which variation now has become crucial, in which multiplicities or collectivities have become crucial because evolution does not happen with Adam and Eve. And that collectivity searches blindly a space of possibilities. The second form of thinking that Deleuze latches on or borrows from science but then makes it work for, for, for philosophy is called intensive thinking. Let me introduce the word itself. Intensive in a thermodynamics textbook, when you open it up and read for the, in, go for the definition, you will find that they, they, they distinguish extensive properties from intensive properties. Extensive properties are properties like length, volume, area, Intensive properties are properties like pressure, speed, uh, density, temperature. And the difference is that, at least in the textbook difference, is that while extensive properties can be divided in space, one can take a one meter, uh, one meter long ruler, break it in two parts, and one ends up with two, one ends up with two half meter rulers. In other words, where areas can be divided, volumes can be divided, Temperature, pressure, and so on cannot be divided. If one takes one gallon of water at 90 degrees temperature and divides it into two, one has two half gallons, but they are not two half gallons at 45 degrees of temperature. They are two half gallons at 90 degrees of temperature. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But Deleuze sees more in this. That is the textbook definition. 
The list says more in this, and he says, forget about the textbook definition. It's good, but it needs to be extended philosophically. First of all, let's reintroduce the word difference. That's the key word in Deleuzian philosophy. His main book is called Difference and Repetition. And the differences are intensive difference. He says, intensive differences drive processes. They are active. They are productive. They, for instance, if you take, but let's go back again to our, you know, a, a box of air divided into two parts. Then we, one heats up air on one side. Now we have hot air and cold air separated by a barrier. If one opens a tiny little opening in the barrier, the cold air, the hot air is going to, it, it, it has the tendency, just like the soap bubble has the tendency to minimize surface tension. Here, the, the intensive differences tend to be minimized. There's a spontaneous flow from one side to another. A, 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 the, perhaps the best example to, to have in your mind as to what, intensive, what an intensive map would be, imagine a map, a map of Earth which shows the continents with their coastlines and so on. That would be an extensive map. Most maps are extensive. They are based on lengths, the lengths of the coastlines, the areas covered by continents, and so on. An intensive map is the map you see every night in your meteorological report, you know, when you're checking out the weather. It's a map that has, it has a zone of high pressure and a zone of low pressure. So differences, differences in pressure. A cold front, a warm front, a mass of air moving at this speed, another mass of air moving at another speed. Those intensive maps shows you the, the coupled system, atmosphere, hydrosphere for what it is. A, 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 a place where process is constantly occurring, where intensive differences move, because you need to see these maps animated, the zones of high pressure moving in one direction, the lows moving in another, and the differences in intensity, as long as they don't cancel themselves out, in our case they don't cancel themselves out because we have sun shining on one side of the earth at any one time, keeping those differences alive, will drive processes and will get, will give a, 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 a birth to form. This, those intensive differences give birth to hurricanes and tornadoes, give birth to, to good weather and bad weather, give, give a, a, a birth to different air currents like the jet stream that have their own form and their own dynamics. Whereas extensive properties define final products, define that which is already kind of done and finished. Of course, even the most done and finished thing, like, like our continents, are in constant uh, 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 process because underneath us all there are gigantic self-organized lava conveyor belts moving the plates of plate tectonics against one another and making the Himalayas go one millimeter a year and having produced the Rockies, you know, all, all the dramatic landscapes that we see in our, in our travels are actually produced by those gigantic conveyor belts as they move this rock on top of them. But those gigantic conveyor belts are also fueled by differences in intensity, by intensive differences. So this is the second time the word difference appears here. Notice that. It's crucial that intensive differences are there. Notice that in, an intensive difference is, is the, the word difference is being used in a different way than, uh, say, when I say uh, this hand is different than this watch, because it, that is different, but that is only is a negative use of difference. All, all I'm saying is that they lack resemblance to one another, that they have no similarity. So it's a negative use of difference. Deleuze wants a positive use of difference. And intensive differences give them the clue. Now, in biology, intensive differences manifest themselves in the process of embryogenesis. As genes, at the moment you have a fertilized egg that's beginning to develop into an embryo, and as the different organs begin to form, of course the genes play a very important role there, directing uh, uh, the, 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 um, the process, but most of the process is driven by intensive differences. In this particular case, it's differences in concentration or differences in density in the concentration of certain morphogens, certain chemicals. Uh, the, the chemical would concentrate in a certain part of the embryo and at that point, you know, a limb would emerge and then that limb would grow and another concentrations of, uh, uh, intensive concentrations of a chemical, the, the fingers will spread out and so on for every organ and so, and, uh, 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 and, 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 uh, and part of the body. So, 
genetic information with its differences, with its variation, depends on the existence of intensive differences in order to keep the process going. Now, another characteristic of intensive properties or intensive thinking that the list mentions a lot is the fact that intensive, different, intensive properties are always characterized by critical points at which matter spontaneously changes architecture or form. The perfect example here is if you take water as an example and then think of it water as ice, as liquid water, and as vapor. At very specific points of intensity, 0 degrees centigrade, 100 degrees centigrade, water changes spontaneously from one architecture, from one form, from one structure to another. It crystallizes at 0 degrees centigrade or liquefies. It vaporizes and becomes steam uh, or remains liquid with all its different uh, uh, possibilities. Then the liquid form has its own line of intensity defining different regimes of flow at very slow speeds. Liquid water flows in a uniform way. At a critical point of speed, it begins flowing in a wavy or periodic kind of way called convection. At another critical point, it becomes turbulent and it's iris within iris within iris. It's another spontaneous architecture that emerges. <laughs> and those critical points of intensity called phase transitions are also crucial because they define a lot of things in biology. Animals, for instance, have different gates. A horse, you can put it in a thread mill and, 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 and uh, it mo it change the speed of the thread mill at very slow speeds, a horse would uh, walk. Then you start you know, uh, increasing the speed. You know, if you think of a horse as Mr. Ed, it's like all freaked out, it's like, oh, Wilbur, what's happening here? You know? <laughs> At a critical point of speed, the horse has to jump, has to switch to trotting. And then at another critical point of speed, well, <laughs> it, has to, it has to break into galloping. Now, walking, trotting, galloping are three modes, three gates, involve different muscles uh, and emerge spontaneously after a critical point of intensity. Now, those critical points of intensity are crucial to in the formation of, of the embryo and, and its development. Just about every organ is born at a concentration of intensity and branches out or throws up uh, you know, uh, uh, veins and, and nerve connections and so on following phase transitions. So DNA depends crucially on the existence of an intensive world, of a world charged with differences, which is active and morphogenetically pregnant, so to speak. Finally. There's topological thinking. Here I need to get a little, you know, more, because it's mathematics, I don't want to start, you know, boring anybody here. But topo topology, unlike Euclidean geometry, involves a completely different conception of space. Uh, the simplest way of exploring this is, is historically, by telling you how uh, non-metric or non-Euclidean geometries were born. When Gauss and Riemann, the 19th century uh, uh, pioneers who created uh, uh, the, the for differential geometry, which is the geometry of soap bubbles. Uh, they began with a question of, well, if we have a, a two-dimensional piece of paper that's bent, say that's bent following a curve like this, the way the Cartesian way of thinking about it was, well, you take the two-dimensional surface, you put it in a three-dimensional shoebox, so to speak, with these coordinates, and then you measure the rigid lengths or distances that each point in the surface has from the coordinate system. And for every point in the surface, you give it an x, y, and z address. That is, the distances from the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis. You always need a transcendental space, a space that's one dimension larger than whatever you're studying. In the case of two dimensions, it's a three-dimensional space in order to metricize it, in order to, to, to divide it, to make it in a way extensive. And Gauss thought, do we really need this? I mean, is, it, is there any other way of thinking about space without rigid lengths and, and definite coordinate systems and, and, and grids? Isn't there a, a better way of thinking about this? And he thought, well, we already have the differential calculus. This is the third appearance of the word difference. Differential calculus. Of course, differential calculus triggers panic sweat in everybody 
after having gone the horrific math classes in high school, I remember I did, you know, I didn't understand what the hell was that supposed to be. How, how was that relevant to me? I was good at math, I got A's, but I hated my teacher. He was boring, and I'm sure most of you did too. But the differential calculus actually is quite special because it is a very, it's the most powerful modeling tool in physics. It's used particularly prior to quantum physics and so on. It was the most important way of trying to capture the dynamics of, of processes, material processes in the world. You know, not to get into a, into a whole thing about the calculus, you know, a hacker is used to black boxing whatever you don't want to talk about. You just, just hide it and think about what goes as an input, what comes as an output. Forget about how it works. So let's do that. Let's black box it. And the only, the only operator we need is a differentiation operator. It takes as an input a rate of change. The, the, the velocity or speed with which something is changing, which, with which something is becoming different. This is the third sense of difference which, is, which matters here. For instance, the rate of change of position relative to time, that's speed, that's velocity. But it can also be, you can be an engineer that's trying to calculate, you know, you're trying to build a dam in a river, you're trying to calculate how much pressure that water is putting on the dam, and so you want to see, calculate the rate of change of pressure relative to depth, because it will be more, the, the, the deeper you get, the more water on top of you have, the more pressure there is. Or it can be any other rate of change. And the black box, the differentiation operator, spits out an instantaneous value for that. So for instance, maybe you're a ballistics expert who's analyzing a murder, and uh, you want to know at what speed was the bullet going right before it hit the victim. You, know, you don't want to know the average speed of the bullet from the moment it left the gun to the moment it hit. You want to know the instantaneous value the, the bullet had right before it hit the victim, right? And so you use the differential calculus. You put in the, the rate of change of, of, of position with respect to time of the bullet, out it comes the specific moment at which the bullet hit, hit, hit the victim. So Gauss thought, can we use this to get rid of all those coordinates and all those metric Cartesian kind of uh, jail tra uh, cells that, that, that confine our, 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 our thinking about space? And, and, he, and he, the answer that he came up with was yes. We can take our surface and at every point calculate the instantaneous rate of change of curvature. And that will now give us, strictly with local information, without going into the shoebox and, and, and metricizing and coordinating this, this surface, it gives us strictly with local information how fast that surface is changing in its curvature at every single point. What that means is that the surface, first of all, you can kick out the three-dimensional space. You don't need it anymore. You can do everything with local information. And the surface becomes a field of rapidities and slownesses the rapidity or slowness with which curvature is changing. So for instance, if in a cross-section our surface looks something like this, over here is not changing curvature at all, so the speed is very slow or, not, or, or none at all. Then it begins picking up speed and it accelerates, decelerates, and goes to nothing again. A uh, completely different idea of what space is. 70, then the, uh, uh, Gauss solved the problem for two-dimensional manifolds, as these bent surfaces are now called. His disciple, Riemann, was supposed to be, you know, humble and nice and just go for the three-dimensional case, but he not. He went for the whole enchilada. He solved the n-dimensional case. He solved the case for all kinds of dimensions. And so he, in, he began, at that moment, a completely new differential view of space. So we now have three forms of difference. Einstein, of course, <coughs> became famous when he thought, hey, no one has used this. It's been 70 years since Riemann wrote this. No one has used it. And Newton assumed that the entire universe was inside some big shoebox called absolute space, which of course doesn't exist. They're, shoes, they're not shoes that are that large. <laughs> And uh, Einstein thought, hey, maybe we can get rid of the shoebox and instead calculate the shape of space strictly with local information using these new ideas. That's how he managed to 
think about the fact that the sun has so much gravitational energy that in fact it curves space around it. He came up with that idea in the early 20th century. No one really believed it except that the math was perfectly clear. But we needed experimental evidence. The only way of, th of really proving this was, well, there are certain stars that during the day appear are right behind the sun. But at night, they are now in a different position. We can measure the distance between the stars at night. But during the day, the rays of light that come out of the stars and reach our eyes have to pass through the gravitational field of the sun because the sun is in front of them. And so the sun should curve those light rays. And the, the, the two stars should appear farther apart than they, in fact, are, because there should be a kind of optical illusion due to this distortion of space. But of course, you cannot measure that distance because the sun is in front of it, making, you know, ruining the thing. <laughs> so in 1919, there was a big eclipse, a total eclipse. The Royal Society of London sent uh, observers. The, the Royal Academy of Paris sent observers. And all of them went there to measure the distance between the stars to see if Einstein was right. And Einstein was right to the last millimeter. He became a superstar. <laughs> so, and change the way we think about space. All, all of a sudden, space became differential. Difference, once more, made its entrance into, the, into, the, into our ways of thinking and created a new way of thinking about space. Just like intensive thinking had created a new way of thinking about process, and just like population thinking had created a new way of thinking about evolution. Three forms of difference, three new ways, reasoning styles, which are absolutely necessary to run the genetic algorithm. I already said that somehow, this is where I tell my students, you have to become hackers, because someone is going to have to put this into code. Someone needs to reproduce within the computer this intensive this, this intensive differences, every branch of art has different intensities, deals with different intensities. Those need to be represented somehow in the computer, otherwise it's not going to fly. How is topological thinking going to affect this? Well, topological spaces, which are similar to differential spaces, slightly, except slightly, slightly more abstract, but basically in the same direction, away from metric coordinates and that kind of stuff, have also been used throughout the 20th century to, uh, uh, as representations for spaces of possibilities. You simply assign an intensive quantity to each one of the dimensions of the space, and now the space, each point in the space becomes a space of, pos it becomes a possible state for a given the system that you're modeling, the system that you're representing. Uh, then, then you, can, then you can explore whether that space is structured or not, whether every possibility has the same probability of occurring, or whether there are certain states that are the most probable of them all. For instance, in the case of a soap bubble, unconstrained, the most probable state is the sphere. And that will appear in that space of possibilities as a point which attracts all the different processes. And this is why soap film is attracted, in a way, to a sphere. That's how a sphere comes out of soap film, by being a, a, the attractor of the process. Attractors, and, and, and you know, remember the word chaos, as in chaos theory, it always refers to chaotic attractors. The important word is attractors, not chaos, because attractors are, are features of topological spaces which represent tendencies in material systems. And so 20th century physics, particularly self-organizing complexity theory, all that kind of stuff of the last 30 years, depends crucially on using these spaces. Hello? <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you, talk, thought you were talking to me. Um, so uh, just a second. Let me just get my train of thought back here. So why is this important? Because the genetic algorithm is a search algorithm. <laughs> It's a search algorithm which explores a space of possibilities. So we, uh, the, 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 the putting together a population of variable replicators with any kind of filtering or sorting device uh, to play a role of selection pressure creates a search process. But what is that process searching? Well, it's searching a space of possibilities. But how can we represent to ourselves that space of possibilities? Well, we, with topological spaces. Let me give you an example. 
Biologists speak, they use the word phylum. Phylum is basically one more division in the tree of life. The tree of life begins by dividing into animals and plants. Then animal, and then that's the first kingdom, that's the first division. And the next division down is called a phylum. We as vertebrates belong to the phylum chordata. But besides that, phylum tends to refer to an abstract body map. A body map that can be stretched and bent and fold during embryological processes to yield a giraffe, or can bend and fold and stretch to yield a rhinoceros. It can be bent and fold and pocketed and then to give a kangaroo, and so on for every single vertebrate. All kinds of designs come out of that space. So the space is rich with possibilities. And of course, the abstract vertebrate cannot be defined metrically, because if you define it in terms of lengths, the neck, for instance, would have to be defined as a length, rigid length, and then you would not be able to get to stretch it to get the giraffe, or shrink it to get the rhinoceros. Uh, the, the, the limb of the phylum of, our, of this topological vertebrate, let's call them, the limb cannot have any definition of lengths or anything. It's just the connectivity, how the bones are connected to one another. But that, limb, that abstract limb or topological limb needs to be such that the genes can, the moment they get to the fingers, they can repress this finger from coming out, leave this one hanging, and end up with a hoof, as in a horse. Or they can prolong the, the lengthening of the finger process and end up with something that cannot grasp things anymore, but that can serve as a wing. Or it can short, you know, it, it, it stop the growth at a, certain, at a certain length and end up with a hand and its opposable thumb. A vertebrae limb has to have all those possibilities, at least in the body map of the phylum. So the idea would be to, be to use topological spaces as spaces of possibilities to represent a phylum. And that would explain why the first artists that began using the genetic algorithm, such as William Latham, seem to run out of shapes right away. You know, you open the book of William Latham, and it's very impressive. You see the generations, you see the genealogical tree showing you how the thing evolved, but then you begin to get the feeling that he's running out of shapes, that he's not finding new shapes, that the search space is too small. And, of course, the search space of the vertebrate phylum, or the phylum chordata, is gigantic. And it can leave entire areas unexplored during, you know, in the Triassic and Jurassic periods and so on. The when reptiles dominated, they had all this incredible variety of designs, velociraptors and T-Rex and so on. And mammals were a bunch of rat-like, hairy rat-like creatures that, you know, if a Martian would have come to Earth, would say, well, I don't give them any future. Man. Reptiles are the ones who rule here. Look at those ugly rats, man. <laughs> then all of a sudden, a meteorite comes in wipes all those ugly reptiles, opens up all these niches in, 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 eco in, in, in ecosystems for mammals to begin differentiating and begin to become, you know, everything from uh, whales and dolphins to uh, uh, bats and, and rats and dogs and chihuahuas and so on. Uh, an incredible explosion of the science once the space is open. So space, in fact, we have not exhausted it. We don't even know how many other designs are in that space of possibilities. So an artist, using the genetic algorithm, needs to bring topological thinking in order to design search spaces. Part of what he or she loses in terms of designing the final product, because now that is done evolutionarily, it gets recovered back in the process of designing the very spaces of possibilities that evolution searches. Of course, we have not yet have textbooks on principles of topological design, but someone should write the book, because that is one of the, one of the futures of, of, of software, uh, is to begin training us, to begin thinking non-metrically, to begin thinking in these different forms, in order to invent the spaces of possibilities, and then, yeah, unleash the genetic algorithm to search it for us while we are asleep, maybe, so that it, you know, when we wake up in the morning, we can, oh my God, did I do that? I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> At any rate, it's time for me to conclude. And so what I want to say in, in, you know, a, a, in conclusion is the neomaterialism that Deleuze has proposed based on these three modes of thinking is, is drastically different from the one that we need to leave behind, the one that informs Marxism and that it has informed the thinking by the left the last 150 years. 
I cannot give you all the economic and sociological and, and historical consequences of this. You can read that in my book, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, 1698, at a bookstore near you. <laughs> but there are many consequences, political consequences of thinking like that. Uh, because you need to start bringing the environment. You need to start bringing the intensive uh, uh, processes that occur with or without us, but that we need to watch out because changing the temperature of the planet, for instance, the way we're thinking, we are right now warming the Earth, increasing an intensive property without really caring what all kinds of phase transitions that can happen. How our epidemics are going to begin stretching their, you know, a certain malaria, which right now sticks around only in tropical areas as things get hotter, well, malaria is also going to expand. There's going to be all kinds of phase transitions that we don't know because we don't care, or apparently, at least our governments don't care, uh, precisely because we think in extensive terms. We don't think in terms of critical points that can be reached and then they are irreversible. Unless we begin to, to change our way of thinking in intensive ways, we're not going to be able to, to do that. But also topological thinking and population thinking are very important in ways that I cannot go into detail here. So what Deleuze has done is liberated materialism from what was basically an a priori process, dialectics, invented by Hegel. I admire Hegel because he was gutsy. You know, you had to give it to him when you read the books, you know, someone who believed in his own ideas so much as to dialectically generate all the concepts in a book in a way that almost reminds you of morphogenesis is, is admirable. Unfortunately, it's not true. <laughs> and so you can respect it as a piece of philosophical architecture that, happened, that happens to have a beautiful monumental shape and at the same time, you say, well, it's, it's history. We need something new, something that, that connects with science, but at the same time, that does not make so slaves to science, that allows to take scientific concepts, just like I just did, go past the textbook definitions, which is all that scientists need, De derive all the real consequences of this reasoning style and then apply them in our own philosophical thinking. I believe that it's only with the injection of this new materialism that the left will be rejuvenated. I, I have great hopes for it. Once we, of course, rid Gilles Deleuze of his crazy terminology, because one of the obstacles of reading Deleuze is that he, th he doesn't think that everything I just said is complex enough. He has to add different terms for every chapter, you know, just to confuse the hell out of us. He probably thought, well, you know, I'm reading Spinoza, which is a 400-year philosopher. I'm reading Leibniz, which is a 300-year philosopher. They can wait for me to... I don't have 200 years. I want my Deleuze now, and I want it clean and depost-modernized. And so, if we can manage to do that, and this is something that is very experimental and where artists as a collective need to also be part of the process, we might be able to create a new materialism that would inject new youth into the old left. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can take some questions. Come on. <laughs> OK. Well, I mean, I, I understand totally what you're saying. You're right now referring to questions of style, of course, which is, goes beyond form because now it's, uh, it's a system of forms in a way. The, the, the example of the brush stroke is not so good because then form, remember that form can be the form of the overall painting, the composition, but it can also be the form of the strokes themselves. Form has to be seen at all these different levels of scale in music from, from a few, you know, three or four notes to, to entire symphonies. There will be form, you know, scaling up. But you're right, style is one thing I left out. But on the other hand, when we talk about the phylum chordata, we're talking about style, isn't it? Isn't, is, aren't vertebrates a kind of style? You can tell them apart immediately from the phylum arthropoda, which is insects. And insects, in all their incredible variety of forms, form a style. And so what Deleuze would say is, styles didn't need us to come into being. It's the other way around. 
nature has styles and it is we humans that need to learn from that because we are part of it, we are made out of flesh and blood, we are one of those styles and, and in order to assert our singularity, our uniqueness, our difference, it is important of course that we need to, to start considering all the different forms of difference, difference in variation, difference in intensity, difference in, in, in the kind of differential calculus that I just said, that exist in nature, that power nature, and try to use it. A lot of times we use those things unconsciously. We are simply good artists that don't know how to explain what we do, but we can, we can tell about intensities, we can tell whether a painting strikes us or is powerful, or on the other hand is subdued because it's subdued on purpose, and you're playing with intensities, not necessarily using that vocabulary. Now the last thing that Deleuze would want to do is impose a particular ideology on artists, because artists are the search process, are, you know, they are the kind of probe head at, at the tip of the search process. And so Deleuze always kind of let them pass. Proust and Kafka as literary creators, he followed them rather than say, oh, well, I'm better than Kafka, I'm better than Proust. He quotes them as, as people who saw, who, who drove humanity in a particular intense direction. Same thing, he wrote a couple of books on cinema. He wrote about Francis Bacon and painting. Uh, he writes quite a bit of, uh, about music in A Thousand Plateaus with Felix Gattari. So for him, artists are the kind of cutting edge of this process. What he would want is that when artists begin to talk about their art, that they would have a better vocabulary. Instead of deconstructing things, when many things, the word deconstruction, they, they don't even know what it means. You know, I've, I ask the question, what deconstruction means to every person that uses the word deconstruction in front of me? No one has been able to define it. <laughs> what does that tell you? And of course, I was at the dentist the other day opening a Cosmo magazine. I don't normally read that, but I thought I may answer the questionnaire. <laughs> I was at the dentist, for God's sake. And there was, there he was, deconstructing lipstick. <laughs> Great. So what the list would want us to do is, yes, do art, but the moment you start talking about your art, don't go hide behind those funky words. Use words that mean something. Because the last thing we want artists to be doing is giving us these pseudo-explanations of their art casted in the latest terminology. I saw a hand somewhere, yeah? Um, it seems that the, we as a species are in a place in history to be able to, to some degree, to a large degree, edit and control what genetic mutations we're willing to accept or in most, most cases than not, deny such as uh, diamond twins or any other number of um, diseases and so on and so forth. And how, I, I'm interested in what your thoughts are on that and how that... Well, I mean, we are, you're absolutely right. We are right now at a point in history where we, can have, we have access to secrets we don't know or are responsible to handle. Let me just give it to you, to put it this way. What makes a species besides natural selection is what is called reproductive isolation. The moment two reproductive communities that used to be one community get separated for whatever reason, a, a, a river changed course and now passes in between them, and they eventually begin to diverge and they don't, cannot mate with one another. Imagine here the perfect example is horses and donkeys. Horses and donkeys can mate mechanically, they can, you know, hump. They can actually, uh, the eggs and the sperms are compatible, but the result is a mule which is a sterile, and therefore the genes won't go through there. They are reproductively isolated. We are reproductively isolated from chimpanzees in a much harsher way. The sperm won't even fertilize the egg. And we're reproductively isolated from whales in an even greater sense, mechanically won't even work. Uh, so reproductive isolation is what gives a species its enduring historical identity. But it is, precisely because it's not an essence, it's a contingent barrier. It's something that is there, and it can be very harsh, but it is breachable because it's a historically contingent thing. All species are individuals, in the same way in which we are individuals. Once we kill zebras, when we drive them to extinction, there won't be any more zebras, which has an ethical connotation much greater than if there was a zebrahood out there, because then we can kill all the zebras, but then zebrahood will come back. <laughs> because there's no zebrahood, they won't come back. Now, the fact that the barrier is historical means that we, with biotechnology, can breach it. As we speak, there is a factory in upstate New York which is trying to manufacture uh, spider silk. Spider silk 
Sp spiders make that nine different types of silk, depending on the, the whether some part of the, the, the structural aspects of the, of the spider web, others to capture insects. Uh, the one particular type of silk is, is so strong that it's stronger than Kevlar. Kevlar is the material they use to make uh, bulletproof vests. And so the scientists are trying to produce spider silk, right? But spiders, because they're predators, unlike silkworms, don't allow themselves to, to be domesticated. You know, put 200 spiders, come on, produce some silk, and they won't do it. So what did they do? Well, they figure out the protein that makes this chains that we call spider silk. Then they figure out the genetic code of it. They found the gene in the spider. They took that gene and implanted it into a goat. Right? Now, when I first heard about this, I thought that the result was going to be spider goat. <laughs> You know, a goat dressed in blue and red going, bah, bah. But no, nothing, nothing as exciting as that. On the other hand, what's happening here is that the goats, this genetically engineered goats, express that protein. But of course, they don't have any use for, for spider silk. So they just, they kind of excrete it in their milk. And then what, the, what it is a factory that actually exists right now as we speak, right? They take the milk, they separate the milky part from the other stuff, and then they extrude it through, through tiny little pores to create spider silk. Now it all seems like, oh wow, another triumph for humanity. Well, let's wait and see. We don't know what happens when you begin breaching these historically contingent barriers, but that are there not for a purpose, but in a complex arrangement of things. You begin fooling around with this, you know. And of course, it's just a matter of time before genetic engineering begins appear, you know, being applied to humans. It's going to be illegal for a long time, but then tattoos are illegal, you know, and all kinds of cosmetic changes that you can make to your body are illegal, and yet that doesn't stop people from doing it, right? Today we have people who go to Star Trek conventions, you know, and, and they learn how to speak, speak Klingon, and they teach their kids how to speak Klingon. <laughs> And one day those guys may want rhino genes in their forehead because they think, you know, Klingon rhino kind of foreheads are very cool. And I'll bet you they're going to find someone who's going to do it illegally. So our own barriers are not safe. And what was what's going to happen once we start fooling around with those things? We don't know. This is probably one another reason why genetic algorithms could be useful because they could allow us to begin visualizing prior to that Klingon future uh, what would happen once we begin transplanting rhinos, rhinoceros genes into our foreheads? Another question, yes? Uh, I would like to know if you see any similarity between Berlin's philosophy and Buddhism, because in Buddhism there, there is a non-duality, it goes beyond the likeness, and, and it has an interest Uh, absolutely, and in fact, Deleuze mentions uh, Zen Buddhism as one particular branch several times in his writings as the one religion that would be the most compatible with what he's talking about. And not only Deleuze, there is a, a, a person, his name is Francisco Varela, who began as a, neuro, as a cognitive scientist, neuroscientist, and began to apply these ideas about self-organization to the tribes of neurons, to the insect colonies, so to speak, that inhabit our brain. Uh, and, and self-organized into thoughts and images and, 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 and feelings. And he was a Buddhist. He, re he died recently, but he obviously found that there was a very direct connection between certain meditation techniques and certain, certain, ex certain uses of your body in which you use your, your breathing rhythms to pulse certain other rhythms and then focus the mind in certain ways to experience precisely the topological that which is non-metric, you know, which the, the patterns in nature which go beyond the actual products and inform the process that create products. So I myself am a little bit more because, you know, uh, I, I come from Mexico, very Catholic kind of country, you know, with very bloody Jesus Christ and so on. And somehow, you know, religion has always been one of those things I want to get away with from. But uh, if there was one religion that I would respect or that I would be would find compatible with this materialism would be would be Buddhism, certainly. Yes, I'm sorry, I'll get back to you. Um, yes, this is a, another parallel that I was saying, but it's a, quite different. And it's also interesting that it comes from the political right that uh, Hayek, Hayek's uh, uh, criticisms of uh, the Marxist plan economy Yeah, 
Yeah, you know, the worst thing that could have happened to Hayek was when Reagan adopted him. I'll bet you that Hayek was turning, turning in his grave going, oh my God, that bad actor. And now he's president. I'll tell you how that connects with that. I believe that Hayek is right in talking about markets as self-organizing things. What he was wrong about is to think that corporations belong to the market. I've written plenty about this. I have many essays that you can get from the net. Just type the Landa and economics, and there's at least 20. I call them anti-markets precisely because they are more like bureaucracies than they are like markets. Any, any product that you find in your house that's not produced by a small producer in a, in a real competitive a, a, a situation with hundreds and hundreds of people competing is producing a corporation which is closer to the central planning of a socialist state than it is to anything that Hayek ever talked about. There are very few areas of the world today that actually display economic self-organization. I can name them with my one hand, uh, even with a horse's hand. <laughs> uh, there's the third Italy, that region in Italy between Milan and, and Venice uh, uh, called uh, Emilia Romana. You know, cities are Modena, Bologna. Uh, it's about 30,000 small businesses competing against each other. It's capitalist, you make no mistake about that. But small because they are driven by designers. And they know that the moment you bring managers and accountants and a hierarchy and you become a joint stock company and so on, the designers are the last ones to have a say in how the companies run. So here we have 20,000. This is a figure that I got from, you know, it might, might have changed, but several thousand small businesses that do design. You know, the Italians, how good they design. They, in, the, in this particular region, they do textile design, ceramics, but also industrial design. They design machines. And it has a completely different dynamics. You know, you still have bosses and workers, but because the typical size of a factory is 100 people, I mean, of a, of a, of a firm is 100 people, a, a motivated worker who is also a designer can become his or her own boss. The moment the, the, this firm grows too large, it splits into two. And there's much less barriers to entry for workers to becoming bosses. So there's a lot more social mobility. They have not eliminated is not a perfectly equal society, but then again, perfect equality needs to be enforced by a super powerful state. And all you're really doing is creating a class of enforcers, which is what went wrong with Marxism. There are certain parts of Silicon Valley that are like that, particularly those that grew around Apple Computer, when Apple Computer was started by two hippies and $1,300 in a garage. They, they created the Apple II with an open architecture, which meant that people could design boards to plug in the boss. And they did not try to, to corner all the profits. They realized that if they opened it, a cottage industry of hardware designers, software designers, and so on, was going to emerge around it. And they seeded Silicon Valley that way. Of course, Apple eventually grew too large. There's a phase transition there. A phase transition is when you cannot finance yourself from bank credit and you need to sell stock options. You need to go public. The IPO, the famous IPO that everybody went crazy during the bubble and the internet. At that point, 1984, they kicked Jobs out, Steve Jobs. They brought in a manager from Pepsi Cola as if selling computers was the same thing as selling sodas, only less fizzy. You know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what kind of mentality does that. Of course, Apple went down the tubes steadily ever since. They had to bring jobs back at the end of the 90s to kind of infuse a little bit of life into it. You can find those places, but if one, if one uses the word capitalism as a blanket word for everything where money is used and there's, and there's division of labor and so on, you will never see them. Or you begin coming up with silly labels like post-Fordism to, 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 to refer to them. Uh, instead of making an inventory of all the eco economic experiments that are going on in the world, which ones are viable, which ones are exploitative, you know, and, and getting more serious about this. I believe that the loser's materialism can help us a lot in that one. Chris, you had your hand. Yeah. yeah. Well, I found there's a potential contradiction for the form finding process. There's a potential contradiction between the spontaneity and the internal determinant. Structure is the only uh, the most efficient one. 
possible server. So in that sense, it's not for diversity, it's for the optimization. Absolutely. But, yeah, I guess but I'll tell you how you can, yeah, okay, but uh, let me just answer that first part and I'll go back to the two. Yes, but that means only, the only thing that means is that there are the spaces of possibilities, or what they call phase spaces, come in different forms and shapes. The simplest ones have a single optimum. Those were the ones that survival of the fittest evolutionary theorists assumed. They assumed that everything was like a soap bubble. Uh, Fry Otto began with those because those are the simplest ones to handle, and you're right, there is something about the optimizer engineer, you know, in Fry Otto that kind of limits him. But we don't have to be limited like that. We can, we can study topological thinking the way it is and the, to show that the simplest possible space is only the extreme case. We have all kinds of other, I'm sorry, all kinds of other spaces much more complex with much more possibilities like the phylum for the vertebrates. And therefore we don't have to fall for optimizing rationality. We can, we can, in fact, make it into a special case and then say, yes, you guys are right, but that's not the way reality works. For instance, Hayek, that he just mentioned as a conservative thing, Hayek used to believe that the market has only one point that's optimum, the point at which demand and supply cancel each other out exactly. Therefore, there is no wasteful excesses or wasteful deficits. But of course, markets are not like that. Markets have at least periodic equilibria ups and downs, upswings and downswings, and that yet another type of equilibrium, another type of attractor. Today we know that there are chaotic attractors, which actually have internal divergence in them. So they are exactly the opposite of steady state. And we know that all of this come in bunches. This is what topological thinking has done in this century to show us the, the, the great diversity of spaces that we can have. So even though I agree with you that Fry Otto fell for that, and Gaudí too, remember Gaudí, how he calculated the, the facade for the Sagrada Familia? He took a little pieces of cord, of, 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 of uh, threads, and hung little, uh, little uh, uh, bags with sand or something in them. You know, I saw it at the museum. I mean, it, of course, it's upside down. You need to see it right side up. But he was using morphogenesis to design. And he does a lot of that in all of his buildings. In fact, when you see his, his style, it's almost topological, there's something, that even though he didn't know any math and he'd do everything in a much more kind of naive kind of way, intuitively, he, he intuited these spaces. And so the idea here is not to condemn something because a few artists went for the simplest type of spaces. Fry, you know, Fry Otto needs to be considered the starting point rather than the end of a line. You had a second question? No, okay. That's right, but you know, again, we are in a much better position right now with extremely powerful computers, you know, with memory becoming cheaper and cheaper. You know, I just bought a, a new Mac with Maya for $2,000 when it used to be a $40,000 piece of software. Things are getting cheaper. Are, you know, you used to need to go into debt and get a bank loan if you wanted that tool or use it at school. Today you can buy it and have it. Uh, and the sellers of software are listening to artists because they are beginning to realize that the last thing they want to do is give you a tool that imposes its own style on you. They want them, the tools to be flexible. They're hiring artists as consultants, not because they want to do us any favors, but because they want to sell more software. But that is, they're moving in the right direction, in the direction of complexity. Did I see a hand over there? Okay. Excuse me? No. Uh, but no, 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 but what, no, no, why? I, I, my question is, what is your point of view about the use of the, the space, the big book? So. Uh, but unfortunately, I haven't seen it, so I, I have to see it, though. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.